You are sitting in what we call the Angela Davis Room, uh, named, of course, after the great activist, civil rights activist Angela Davis, who was here to christen this room. And before you leave, as you're leaving out here, on top of here, there's a mural behind this wall here with a picture of her and her signature. She signed it when she was here the last time when we first opened this room a couple years ago. Um, so Busboys and Poets is a place where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted, a place for art and culture and politics to come together and collide intentionally, a place to take a deliberate pause and feed your mind, body, and soul. Is we believe creating places like this really is what creates community. Um, when I look at this and I see racism and health, you can substitute health with pretty much anything. Um, schooling, public safety, housing, all of these things are associated with race. I come from Iraq originally. When I first came to America, I learned about race. And I, real, I, and I learned that race matters a lot and that everything that happens in America has race attached to it somehow. So when I opened Bus Boys and Poets, my, one of my first things that I, that, I, that I wanted to do is make sure this is a place that everyone feels comfortable coming into. And part of it is how you interact with people and how, you, how race plays out in restaurants. Race is a very significant part of eating out. Historically, it has been. And uh, even today, we see a lot of discrimination when it comes to people eating out. So when people come in, I, was, I always say that when I train my staff, uh, a host will, will walk in. I'll give you just a simple example. A host uh, will, be, will be here, let's say Saturday morning, and the place is completely empty and it just opened, and we're open for brunch, and a black couple walks in. So you take the black couple and you see them way back in that corner with a lady sitting there, because that's the nicest little corner in the entire place. What is the black couple gonna think? They're going to think, why are you putting me back here? Reverse it and take a white couple comes in here and you see them back in that corner and they're thinking, what a nice little quaint corner they put me in. So, you know, if you don't see race, you'll make these stupid mistakes. Unintentional, but very significant. Uh, if you notice race, and we tell our staff, you got to see race. You can't just pretend like you don't see race. In America, if you don't see race, you're blind. You have to see race. You have to see it and understand it in order for us to move forward. So when it comes to racism and health, we've seen it right in our faces with COVID. Uh, you know, you can't make it any clearer than that, how race has played such a significant role, not only here in D.C., but throughout the country. Uh, and, and so it's, it's wonderful to be able to hear these kinds of conversations. Like I said, this is the reason why I opened Bus Books and Poets, to have these kinds of conversations, because I did believe that race is really a significant part of this country's DNA. And unless we address it head on and talk about it, we'll never move forward as a United States. So thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, uh, Andy, for welcoming, my, wel welcoming us to your uh, space that you've created. I'm Alan Weil. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. Uh, this is our first in-person event in two years, so I'm a little rusty. Uh, forgive me. Um, but it's great that we were able to come together tonight. Um, we, are, we did at 4 o'clock today release the February issue of Health Affairs entirely devoted to the topic of racism and health. Uh, I don't assume you've had time to read it in the last two hours, but we hope you will. Uh, I have a couple of prepared and then a real quick unprepared comment. So I do want to make sure I cover the necessaries. Um, we will, at an appropriate break, uh, screen a, just a three-minute preview of a video interview we did with Harriet Washington that's about a half-hour uh, interview that will come out tomorrow, but we want to give you a little teaser. Uh, it's an amazing conversation with her, the author of Medical Apartheid. Um, the whole issue and everything we're able to do around it has been supported by the Robert Johnson Foundation, the California Wellness Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the New York State Health Foundation. Uh, we rely on support to do these kinds of things, and we're very grateful for that. 
Um, it took a big team to do this, and there are a lot of people from Health Affairs here. I hope you will thank them for their effort. Uh, before I introduce our moderator, I just want to give a moment's attention to why we're doing this. We're an academic journal. We're the leading health policy journal in the United States. We write for and are read by policy leaders. Um, when it came time to do an issue on racism, one of the things that I felt very strongly is that we tend to move to abstractions. It's an uncomfortable topic, so people use words and hide behind words. And one of the many, but one of the defining characteristics of racism is how place-based it is and how it's rooted in institutions and practices that play out in communities. And so if you have a national conversation about race, you leave behind all the realities of the experiences that people actually have. You can talk about redlining. You can talk about inequitable financing. You can talk about who does and doesn't have health insurance. But it's really different to point to a street or a highway that was cut through a neighborhood. It's really different to talk about the big building at the end of the mall having control over the budget and making uh, policy decisions for hundreds of thousands of people. It's a different conversation. We wanted to be a facilitator of that. And so that's what tonight is. It is a conversation. You'll get a quick presentation and then the floor is open because we know that uh, it's not about an academic paper. It's not about a journal article. It's about people's lives and experience and there's a lot of that. Uh, that needs to be brought to the conversation. So we're grateful that you're here. And um, we're going to be led in this conversation by Amanda Gomez, who I just got to meet for the first time tonight, although we've certainly had a few conversations in advance. Amanda's a reporter at WAMU and the DCist. She was at Kaiser Health News as a Peggy Gershom Fellow, worked at the Washington City Paper, and was a health policy reporter at Think Progress. She reported for PBS NewsHour on issues ranging from the Flint, Michigan water crisis to the Affordable Care Act uh, contraceptive mandate. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to sit down and listen and engage instead of uh, lead and turn the hard task uh, over to you. But Amanda, welcome, and thanks for taking us through the conversation today. Thank you, Alan. Good evening. So thank you so much for coming. It's a real treat to be moderating this conversation. Um, so today's discussion will be centered on one of the papers published in the February issue. Um, it is by one Christopher King in the back over there. Uh, he chairs the department. Yep, please give him a round of applause. Congratulations on your paper. So he chairs the Department of Health Systems Administration at Georgetown University. And his paper is called Race, Place, and Structural Racism, a Review of Health and History in Washington, D.C. And we'll, he'll join me on stage so we can get started on his paper. Here, I'll let you go first. And so Mr. King's uh, paper is going to be the jumpstart to our conversation. Um, it examines how racism influences the health of DC residents, particularly black Washingtonians. Um, so with that, I'll kick it off to you to give us an overview. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Andy, it's so good to see you. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you don't know about the, the black and salmon and the fried catfish, please learn about it. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is my favorite restaurant, so it's, it's so great to be here. The, the perfect venue for what we're doing this evening. So can I take about five? Yeah, five please, five take it away. Five? All right. So uh, before I begin, I'd be negligent, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge Alan and the rest of the health affairs team for this very important uh, addition, uh, racism and health, I know it has been a lofty journey. So congratulations on this work. And I also speak on behalf of so many who are so proud that this journal is taking a leadership role 
in increasing the number of underrepresented scholars of color and, and scholarly publishing. So we thank you, and we see you, and we support you in this effort. So we're here to talk about the District of Columbia, our nation's capital, and I must share that this work has been very personal for me. My grandmother is 100 years old. Hi, grandmother, if you're watching. <laughs> she raised eight kids in Washington, D.C., 217 T Street, and I was born at D.C. General. So this body of work, it has truly been a labor of love, and I thank co-authors Brian Buckley, you're probably in the virtual space, Rhea Mahishwari, and Dr. Derek Griffith, uh, my senior author on the publication. Thank you for your, your support and contribution. So over the years, I've had, I would say, probably the opportunity to talk to thousands of residents about their health care experiences in the city. And this body of work has been inspired by those individuals. So at this moment, I just want to thank them for sitting down with me and talking to me very candidly about their experiences in the city. So I'm hoping we can all agree that if we are serious about achieving racial justice and eliminating disparities in health, it is imperative, absolutely imperative, that we examine the practices and policies and events that have created, that have sustained, and continue to undergird racial, racial hierarchy. And that's what this exercise has been all about. Uh, because we know that health is shaped by factors, as you all know, education, housing, income, environmental conditions. So it's important for us to lift up the voices of those who have been systemically oppressed and tell those stories. Those stories will help us find our way. They'll help the city find its way, will help the nation find its way. So in the paper, Amanda, we reflect on practices and policies and events that have over the, within the past 200 years have compromised the health and well-being of black residents. We believe that acknowledging the past and conducting critical audits of our work today, and that applies to all sectors and all disciplines, right? We believe this level of intentionality is a prerequisite for stimulating atonement, atonement in health policy making and the creation of novel practices that can undo the damage. So in order to corroborate this, 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 um, the importance of this type of historical analysis, we begin by providing the reader with an overview of the stark disparities in health outcomes and socioeconomic status by place and race. And I know that it was just released a couple hours ago, so you have not had an opportunity to read it. So this is a quick teaser. For example, you all know black men in the city, black women can expect to live uh, 17 years less or 12 years less, respectively, than their white counterparts. Intermortality rates are highest east of the river, where 92% of residents are, are, are black. And the study conducted by the Urban Institute just a few years ago found that white households in the city have household uh, incomes um, uh, 81 times greater than, um, uh, than black, when we're talking about wealth. So I can go on and on but these are seemingly intractable trends that we've seen in our city for so long, and we tell more of that story in the publication. But I do want to share a few milestones uh, that we document in the paper, which can help us connect the dots and make sense of trends that we see today. We all know there's a link between political representation and a population's health and well-being. So from the federal government's not permitting the city to use its own funds to support the needle exchange program during the height of the AIDS epidemic to inequitable distributions of CARES funding just recently. Um, we share these examples of the health implications of not being politically represented as a state. And note, this dynamic especially shows up as extremely salient in the event of a national crisis or a public health emergency. And while the rationale for the, dis the for the federal district designation was initially uh, intended to be sure that we had impartial, you know, that we were a, a, a district that was impartial to political ideology. We also addressed explicit efforts in the paper to sustain political disenfranchisement due to emer an emerging black population in the late 1800s. The paper also reflects on research conducted at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was recognized at that time as the, the nation's preeminent place to go for psychiatric care. Research that came out of that institution in the early 1900s reinforced belief systems at the intersection of eugenics 
and mental health or psychiatric care. This would have a harmful impact on blacks, both locally and nationally. We address educational setbacks due to inequitable funding as far back as 1862. And since home ownership is a vehicle for wealth building, we highlight the impact of redlining and racial exclusivity in mortgage lending in the 1900s. We also amplify the destruction of the once vibrant uh, Berry Farms community in the early 1940s, stripping black families from accumulating assets and generational wealth. And housing incentives for whites to move to the suburbs in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, that had a substantive impact on municipality revenue in the city, resulting in unhealthy structural conditions and limitations in access to social services for blacks who remain in the city. It's also important to note that these conditions would leave black residents especially vulnerable for what we now call the crack epidemic in the 1980s. This is an era that was known for mass incarceration and stiffer criminal penalties imposed on blacks, particularly black men. And so, uh, there's research to suggest that the crack epidemic is a key contributor to modern day black white gaps in education, housing, and income. And finally, due to mergers and acquisitions and trends and pair mix, we conclude by highlighting challenges that led to the closure of DC General, uh, Providence, and some service lines at the existing United Medical C uh, Center, which is set to close in 2023. Now, it would be an insult uh, if we did not mention good things that are happening in the city. Dr. Nesbitt, hello, I see you. In the paper, we talk about the creation of the, the DC mm -hmm. Office of Health Equity and the Health Equity Report, which outlines the nine key drivers. Uh, recently, the Racial Equity Achieves Results Act uh, was, was passed, which creates an office of racial equity and the implementation of the racial equity impact assessments. That's certainly a step forward for us. And most recently, the Child Wealth Building Act will help ensure that children and families with low incomes have guaranteed funding when they reach the age of 18. These achievements are important milestones in our journey towards a nation's capital where all residents can achieve their full health potential and live their best lives. And it is our hope that in this paper, we will inspire more novel policy around social and economic justice. It is our hope that this work will better contextualize the conversation that we're having around DC statehood. It is our hope that this paper will push us more to put the health and healthcare and allow us to reconceptualize how we perceive uh, health care, health, and how services are organized, delivered, and financed. So I'll, I'll talk a little, bit, a little long, but I just want to <laughs> no. a high-level overview and tease the audience for what's, what, what they can read when it's about. Thank you, Christopher. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right. And so this is the moment where I turn it to you all. Given the, the expertise in this room, I mean, we have healthcare providers, we have the healthcare. Oh, also, you let me know if you can hear me. I'm going to be keeping my mask on the entire time. <laughs> um, so, given the expertise in the room, again, we have the health director, we have providers here. Um, I wanted to turn to you all. Um, so, the three events, the three phenomena that um, I'd like to unpack here um, would be one, voter disenfranchisement. Uh, the second, uh, the hospital and service line closures. And then the third, um, housing segregation and how these have influenced the, the health of, of DC residents, the health of, of black Washingtonians. Um, so to kick us off, um, I'm thinking we're gonna start from the beginning, um, the lack of DC statehood. I mean, we've not had representations uh, since 1801 when uh, Congress took control over over DC. I mean, we have the Home Rule Act, but Congress can still meddle, meddle in our affairs um, and is trying to right now. Uh, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky is intro or introduced rather uh, legislation to to overturn DC's vaccine requirement in, in schools and businesses. And so I'd like to turn now to one of the co-authors of this piece with Christopher. Uh, Derek Griffith is right <laughs> is in the room. Hello, um, he is a professor at Georgetown. He's the founding co-director of the Georgetown Racial Justice Institute, um, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on why you decided to include disenfranchisement um, in this paper and how you see that 
influencing the health of DC residents. Oh, I don't think, can we get a mic? For, I don't think this goes that far. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And we'll be passing the mic throughout the night. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Um, part of the reason that we focus on disenfranchisement is because we need to have represent. There are a lot of needs that DC and DC residents, and I'm sure the health director can speak to this better than I can, um, that are difficult to address if you don't have the power to, to make decisions on, the, on your own behalf. And so if you can't decide, you you know best what you need as an institution, as a city, as a district. Um, and if you can't address those, then there's no way for you to be able to. Um, address those issues in the context and the, with the efficiency that states can. So it was really in, in much in comparison to states and as much in comparison to other municipalities that had more power and influence to be able to respond um, more efficiently to the, the crises that come up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll just note that in, in D.C. still Congress or rather, uh, thank you, mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, the D.C. Council still has to hand deliver um, our bill signed by the mayor uh, for a 30-day review period. So it's just examples. Um, anyone would like to, I mean, does anyone see a connection between uh, political representation or the need for it and helping reduce um, healthcare disparities? In, in anyone want to offer? If not, I'm going to come to Mr. Ambrose Lane Jr., who is um, the co-founder, let me make sure I don't butcher this, um, is the founder and chair of the Ward 7-based health Alliance Network and the co-founder of Black Coalition Against COVID. How do you see DC statehood benefiting the health of? Well, first, let me say how much I love health affairs. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and I say that, that because back in 2014, when I founded the Health Alliance Network, I started coming to health affairs meetings. And the, one of the first persons that I had come present to us in the community was Bethany Rogerson. And she talked about health impact assessments. And uh, since that time, I have actually been a co-writer for legislation that uh, Council Member Grasso submitted on health impact assessments. As a matter of fact, um, the D.C. Health Department um, actually testified on that. And I was also nominated to be on the Commission for Health Equity by Dr. Nesbitt. So thank you, Dr. Nesbitt, for doing that. Um, but we don't need to get it twisted. Um, yes, there could be impact if D.C. wasn't franchised, but we need to make clear that there are so many other things that can be done regardless of whether or not we get enfranchisement from the federal government in terms of statehood. There, it, it, it's almost as if you have to, we, we take an incrementalist approach. If you drop one drop of rain on the top of a mountain, eventually the mountain will become a valley. But how long does that take? That's billions of years. And the approach that we take, both the federal government, DC government, community organizations, we take an incrementalist approach, and we need much more of what's called a Marshall Plan or something thereof, and it has to be more than just one drop of rain. And unless we do that, we will be standing here a billion years from now talking about the same thing. And so we have to get past the incrementalist approach. Dr. King criticized the incrementalist approach when it came to solving poverty. When he accepted his Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, he said that poverty is nothing new. What's new is that we have the resources to solve it. And here we are 58 years later. And so he was critical of the war on poverty. And the war on poverty, as we know, seeks to address issues such as social determinants, but we haven't solved not one social determinant yet. You can't name a jurisdiction around the country in which we have solved any social determinant. So I just wanted to make sure that that was said. And of course, I could add more. Two minutes is never enough time for me. Oh, no, please. If, if not I'm focusing a, on statehood, then what? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a preacher's son. So yeah. I, 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 <laughs> it, it's in the blood. So, you know, but, but there's so much more. I mean, we, we're addressing the opioid issue as it is right now. Okay. And as you know, Amanda, um, uh, we're addressing it from the ground up. Uh, Live Long DC is a, is a project of the Department of Behavioral Health, and Live Long DC is a good program. But there are also solutions that come from the ranks of people that are living it on the ground, that are engaging 
opioid use disorder on the ground, and they have a different set of solutions. It's not good or bad or against the Live Long DC program. It's just a different take on how some of these solutions can be manifested. And so we have to have both approaches. It's not a one size fits all. It's both approaches. But we have to be able to have those conversations with those people on the ground, as well as those that are providing theory, providing uh, uh, ingenuity from the top. And if it doesn't happen both ways, if, if the if these answers don't happen both ways, then it gets nowhere. To stay on on voter disenfranchisement, I am curious if anyone in this in this room sees lack of statehood, of lack of um, voting power in Congress, if that influencing the work that y'all do. Anyone? Does anyone see that being any? Okay. So no. <laughs> Um, all right, then. Well, then we'll just move on to, to health care delivery. Uh, so D.C. has the second lowest uninsured rate in the in the country. Um, but you need to use your coverage somewhere. And um, as the paper that Christopher and, and Derek notes, um, there have been several closures of hospitals, of service lines, um, in black communities, among them D.C. General in 2001 and Providence Hospital in 2019. Um, and UMC, as, as Christopher said, is expected to close, but uh, not before a new one, a new hospital opens in the fall of 2024. Um, so I'd love now to hear from um, DC Health's, uh, from the DC Health Department, uh, Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt, um, and how you see closures impacting the health of, of DC residents. So, good evening, uh, and good evening. thank you, Alan, uh, for hosting this, but more importantly for your leadership. It, you know, this is always a very tough topic. I think we, uh, many of us who are interested in health equity and discussing racism and health and uh, racism as a public health issue, uh, will always clamor to these types of rooms, but we need to make space to recognize that there are a lot of people who still find this to be an extremely difficult conversation to have, find this a very difficult space for academia to play in, um, given that so much of what we're talking about is often qualitative uh, and isn't studied with the scientific rigor, and we often have to apply mixed methods, and so much of it, what we're discussing is ex experiential in nature. So I just want to acknowledge that an academic journal that us health policy wonks use um, <laughs> is, is taking that approach. Uh, you know, the D.C. conversation is very interesting when we talk about uh, health care facility closures. Uh, and I've been in and out of the district for oh, 14 years now uh, and back in the district for eight and or seven. Uh, this is my eighth year. And one of the things that we don't often talk about in this conversation is that the district is rich in its health care assets. Our challenge is where those assets are and how people access them. Uh, so most of the time our community, when we have a closure of something, has an immediate reaction to saying, oh my God, something is going away. And what we don't have a reaction to is why is that thing going away? Uh, was it of the best quality, right? So I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that having something is better than nothing. If we have an asset in our community that doesn't have the best quality, it doesn't have the best experience for the people who it's designed to serve, then maybe it shouldn't be there. Maybe we should only have things that everyone in our community would clamor to go to. Right? We shouldn't have a second tier or two tier, three tier, four tier healthcare delivery system in our community. I don't subscribe to that, right? So if something goes away because it decides that we can't meet our mission anymore, we're not providing the highest quality services that we want to provide, the community is voting with their feet and is deciding to take their feet and go somewhere else. We have to have an honest conversation in our community about why, in fact, that is. And oftentimes that may have to do with these underlying things related to racism, right? What has been their experience at that facility or lack of investment in that institution because of who goes to that institution? So I think our conversations were better served as a community 
and really unpacking that why things have closed. So I'll go back to, we need to focus on the geographic distribution of our health assets in the district to make sure that they are equitably distributed and that people have access to them readily. We're not gonna solve this conversation, as you all know, about expanding access to coverage, right? When the nation did it, they should have looked at DC. We had already <laughs> checked that box and our health outcomes hadn't improved so much. The, the other thing that I'll say um, about this is that we have to be honest brokers if we're all advocates and we're wanting to improve health equity. The district makes millions of dollars in investment and we keep it a secret. So we make millions of dollars in federally qualified health centers. They are gorgeous facilities to walk into. They have breast care centers. They have top-notch talent who are serving you on a daily basis. They have wraparound services, but yet we still hold on to a philosophy about what our health system looked like 20 years ago. Mm. So we scare people away from things by talking about how bad it is. And when things improve, we don't give that conversation the same voice. So why do we do that? Why do we do that? How much of the disenfranchisement of our people are we playing into because of the stories we want to share? That's not me saying that we need to cover up our bad stuff. We need to own it and we need to be honest about it. But when we have some wins, when we are making progress, we need to celebrate those wins. And that's how we're going to gain the trust of people who are rightly not trusting the healthcare delivery system and health systems because of how we have been treated historically. So it's a mixture to me of looking at the historical injustice that have happened, the contemporary situation and environment that we find ourselves in, if we're truly going to move forward and address head on health and racism. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. And that's a great segue to another voice I'd like to hear from, uh, George Jones, the president and CEO of Bread for the City, a prominent community health center because they're, I believe they opened a new health center uh, last year in Southeast, uh, providing primary medical and dental and vision care services to uh, residents east of the river for the first time in the organization's history. Is that correct? So yes. that's, yeah. So congratulations on that. Um, I'd love to hear you respond to, to what Dr. Nesbitt just said about celebrating our wins and also looking at the history. Yeah, well, definitely the fact that we have coverage at 90 plus percent for people with uh, uh, for health care access is a great thing. But we know, and I think Dr. Nesbitt knows this too, that health outcomes are really only determined by 20 percent of health care. And so the truth of the matter is we were never going to really uh, eliminate the disparities, the socioeconomic and the health disparities by simply making health care ac accessible. We have to deal with the fact that uh, in some ways, and this is just my opinion, but I think the tail that wags the dog in this city is housing and the crisis, the, the lack of quality housing. Uh, and so we have to, we, when we think about health care and we think about health care dollars, we, and I think Christopher said this earlier, we have to think about sort of new ways of using resources and we have to be really honest with ourselves that if people, I talk to people all the time about if people's children have nowhere, no safe place to sleep, they're worried about if they're going to have something to eat, uh, they, they, uh, the housing is substandard. Uh, it's going to be difficult for them to have good health, uh, educational outcomes. The socioeconomic problems they experience are really going to just, uh, you know, be persistent just as they have been. Uh, on the other hand, to also sort of speak to something that Nesma said is, black people in this country have seen amazing success over the last 100 years. So we know that it's possible for black people, th those of us who sort of uh, achieve some level of privilege, to to, to enjoy economic and social economic success. So I don't even, I'm not cynical about the fact that whether it can be done, it's being done even as we speak. I mean, I tell people all the time, I got four children, and the only difference, they're all college graduates, but the only difference between my kids, I think, because they're not like, some of them were smart, some of them were just, just like me, average intelligence, but they were all successful. And the only difference between them and the kids that I see in our centers in Southeast and in Northwest is that they never worried about where they were going to eat or where they were going to sleep or whether or not they had to deal with gun violence. Uh, they simply, all they had to do worry about is go to school and come home, eat, 
and be in a secure place. That's the kind of environment. That's the, that's what's gonna it's gonna take to really um, change the the economic and social economic and health outcomes for the families and individuals here in Washington D.C. The last thing I'll say is. Um, Somebody else already alluded to it, and we've been really talking about it. It's, so in other words, we're talking about we have to deal with the fact that people in this city have been systematically trapped in poverty mm. and oppression. So we have to eliminate those systems, and it will take a while, but we have to be intentional about that. Even while our clinics deal with the sort of what we call the downstream issues, Every day, hundreds of people come to us. They're already in poverty. They're already sick. They're already in trouble. They need somebody to respond to that. But if we really want to change the trajectory of the city, we need to be looking at that and at the same time investing heavily in the fact that their children and their grandchildren shouldn't have to come to bread for the city 10 years from now. They shouldn't, have to, they shouldn't live in environments where their housing is not secure they're food insecure, there's violence. And so we've got to invest in this upstream work. We, it's the systemic stuff. It's changing those things. I think we can do it because it's been done. Uh, it, it really has been done in this country, just not widespread or not enough for black and brown people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it has. And I'm, I'm just thinking now of how DC uh, successfully, I would say, narrowed uh, racial disparities in vaccinations among seniors. I mean, that was that was a win. And um, I think in the beginning, it was in February when vaccinations had kicked off. We saw the disparities um, in majority white wards like Ward 3 um, hovering around, what was it, 40%? Dr. Nesbitt, correct me if I'm wrong. And then in Ward 8, it was 20. And now we're seeing... Um, it was in Ward 8 residents, it's much higher. I think it's, it's it hovering around 80 and Ward 7, it's, or Ward 3, excuse me, around uh, 73. So we're seeing, I mean, it's, that was a very quick uh, moment of narrowing disparities. Um, does anyone else like to respond? Um, if not, I'm going to kick it off to, oh, yes, please. And please introduce yourself. I'm May Tome Cheng. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little bit late driving no, from fine. Princeton, New Jersey, and trying to find parking around here. <laughs> but so I hope I, my remark is not out of turn here. Oh, no. But I, I'm very heartened to hear about the health insurance coverage in the city. Uh, uh, but then uh, but that is a fundamental issue, which DC is ahead of a lot of places in the country. But I think that. Um, in terms of health outcome, uh, I think the Washington DC, the providers and the health systems administrators, managers, uh, might behoove them to look into the outcomes of, of, uh, of residents uh, by race. Because I came across a paper, it was, uh, it was in a competition for an award, research award paper published in the last year, um, <clears throat> on, on how physicians treat patients differently according to the race. And the concrete example was that the amputation rate among black patients is 50%, a full 50% higher than non-white, I mean non-black patients. And now, uh, and, and when, you, when you drill in a little bit, you see that it is not because the black, these patients were sicker. It was just a, a kind of a, a it was in the, in the mind of the providers, the surgeons, when they see a black patient, that somehow it tells them to go more the amputation route. I'd be very happy to dig that paper. I, I have the paper. And yeah. I'll give it to Alan. If you're interested, please get it from Alan. Well, thank you so uh, much. Oh. Right, right. Because, because oh. we, we all know that healthcare quality is a big issue in the United States. Um, we, we, Americans, get the appropriate care 55% of the time. So then you ask yourself, what happened the, uh, the other 45% or the other half of the time? What happened? You know, we're getting care, yes. 
we have coverage, we have access, but what kind of care are we getting is the question. Yeah. And this has to do with quality, and when it comes to, to people, uh, 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 you know, if you want to link this to race and the implications of race in healthcare delivery, I think that is a very serious issue. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your reflections. I appreciate that. Thank and you. I wonder, I mean, I'd open it up to other, I don't know, physicians in the room who've had to uh, navigate a situation where their, their patient is distrustful based on their prior experiences with the healthcare system. I don't know if anyone can kind of piggyback off what she just said. Yes, please. Thank you. And please introduce yourself. Sure. I know you asked for a physician. I'm not a physician, but I'm a scientist. So I'm, um, <laughs> my name is Angela Thomas, uh, Dr. Angela Thomas from MedStar Health, Vice President of Healthcare Delivery Research. Um, my science, my research is in patient safety and health equity. I also uh, am the executive leader of a large initiative called Safe Baby, Safe Moms, which is designed to reduce uh, maternal and infant uh, disparities in the district. So uh, in leading that particular project, I remind the team all the time that we can take housing, food insecurity, uh, all the traditional social determinants of health. I subscribe to the, to the point that uh, racism is a social determinant of health. But I remind them of what we call young, fertile Angela. That's me. If I was young, <laughs> if I was fertile, and I was crazy enough to have another baby. Mm -hmm. and, and the research shows that I am, am at higher risk of having an adverse maternal outcome than my less than high school educated white counterpart, period. So, so there's something going on in, when it comes to the racism I experience outside of the healthcare system and what I experience when I go in the healthcare system. And until we tackle the things that are going on inside the healthcare system, to my sister's point over there, then we can do all of this. And it's important, we shouldn't stop. We should address housing, we should address access, and we should, should address systemic racism that's going on in other spaces. But we have to have the difficult conversation about racism that happens inside the walls of our healthcare system. It is, it is crazy that to level the playing field as myself, I have to say my name is Dr. Angela Thomas, to level the playing field when I go get care in organizations where I work. That's the reality of a lot of people who look different to the CEO's com comment about the table, the two couples in the table and the differences. Those biases are real and they impact the quality of care, but also the safety of our patients who get care as well. So I appreciate it. And, and it's not one paper. It's several papers and books and all the things that can substantiate that point. But it needs to be part of the conversation. Thank you for that. Um, with, oh, yes, no, please. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, please introduce yes, yourself. Um, my name is Diane Lewis. I'm the chair of the D.C. Health, Health Benefit Exchange Authority. Um, and I thank everyone for talking about the, uh, the, the fact that DC leads with regard to uh, coverage and health insurance. While we are not the sole benefit, sole reason that that has occurred, uh, we certainly are a significant contributor to that. And so we are very pleased and very proud of the fact that the District of Columbia is second in the country uh, with regard um, to coverage. And we also recognize um, that that has not changed the result with regard to out healthcare outcomes. And as a result, um, what the board of the exchange uh, chose to do was to establish a social justice working group. Um, and over the last year, um, ending in July of 2021, uh, that working group came out with a number of recommendations. And it addressed, with the recognition that health disparities are critically important, and have to be addressed, housing, poverty, all of that, but also the recognition that there is racism in the health system and that somehow health, the exchange needed to be not only part of the discussion, but part of the solution. Mm. Um, and so what came out of those recommendations 
addressed issues around tra uh, doctor training and education, came out of changing health systems, um, and, and a number of things. Um, so for 2023, we looked at um, the carriers and decided that one of the things that we could do and they could do was to look at plan design. Um, and plan design is a way to less, lessen the amount of financial uh, weight that uh, consumers have to deal with in terms of how they have to pay for their care. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, to focus on those chronic diseases that impact uh, people of color and black folks in particular. And so we focused on diabetes. So that was an issue. And I'll just give you one other. And that was um, we haven't talked about algorithms, and, and that may be in the health affairs, uh, and I would hope it's in the health affairs uh, discussion. Um, but health, many of the health affairs have been identified as, as, as bringing significant barriers and significant uh, bias with regard to folks of color. And so one of the algorithms, the GFR, which measures kidney function, the Kidney Foundation has determined uh, should no longer be used, and the carriers in the District of Columbia will not use them in the next year. Mm. Um, they will follow the, the guidelines of the Kidney Foundation in terms of ceasing to use that. So we're beginning to talk about and beginning to address the issues around bias in healthcare, and I think that's a critical issue, and we need to continue that discussion and come up with solutions. All right. Thank you for offering that. Um, and with that, I'd like us to take just a five-minute break so we could watch this, this trailer. Um, and you could use the bathroom and get more food and make sure to tip your servers. <laughs> The impact of racism has been damaging and long-lasting to the U.S. society. For more than 400 years, racism has influenced practices and policies that have led to unfair disadvantages for some racial and ethnic communities, while in turn providing advantages and sustained powers to others. Scientific racism. Um, have these beliefs ever truly been reconciled or have they been undone by the healthcare system to date? No. We've had a long history of these mythologies being presented as science. They're not science. As Dorothy Roberts pointed out so brilliantly, racism created race, not yes. the other way around. Right. The Tuskegee syphilis study, it's like the well-known that everyone kind of go to, even during this time of COVID, right? But this was not an anomaly. And what are the other key moments in history that you would highlight from medical apartheid? There are so many studies that far exceeded Tuskegee in their venality, and in their harms, in their mortality. Tuskegee is fr frankly, as bad as it is, just a shadow. So how has the conversation on racism and health changed from the time that you wrote The Medical Apartheid till now? It has changed dramatically. When I wrote Medical Apartheid, even writing about racial issues and health was difficult. Frankly, systemic racism was not even in, forget the vocabulary, the mindset of many people at that point. We're not talking about a few bad apples, so to speak. We're talking about a system that's profoundly flawed, has been from the beginning, and needs uh, amendation. Can you speak uh, more about the historical issues regarding consent? African Americans were not, it wasn't their health that was prized. It was their bodies and the work that could be extracted from them. We're in dire straits today in terms of informed consent. We're really in danger of losing it. And we need to be very vigilant on behalf of people who can't fight for themselves. All right. So I would like to continue our conversation on the healthcare delivery system. And I'd actually like to hear from uh, the insurers in the room, or one Karen Dale, uh, the market president for AmeriHealth, one of DC's largest uh, Medicaid managed care organizations in the district. Thank you. Oh, there she is. I was like, where am I? <laughs> so I 
Oh, do you want to? So I feel like the comment. Yeah. Let's yep. go ahead and use that. Sorry. No worries. So I feel like the comments I originally planned to make are going to be more of a summary of some of the things I heard, but I'll add some other things as well. So health equity in terms of giving people an opportunity to attain the best possible health outcomes, I want you to focus on the word opportunity. Having insurance provides opportunity. Having support provides opportunity, right? And so keep the word opportunity in mind because it's, it's where, thankfully, we're headed and where we can accelerate our efforts. And we've heard already that health is more than health care. So health care is that part that happens in a clinical setting. So the biggest influences are racism, which is not about race. It's about how people are treated. And when people are treated in a way, I want you to remove the fact that your insurance card is Medicaid. Because human beings react in a certain way to being harmed, whether it's emotional or physical. It causes us to have a certain chemical response in our bodies and a certain emotional response, which we try to protect ourselves from having again. One of the things I do often is give our members, 124,000 of them, if they call and they want to speak with me, I tell our call center to put them through. And that if they don't reach me, it's okay to give them my cell phone number. Because what I tell them is, if we fail you, if our providers fail you, whether they intended to or not, I want to know. And so a lot of my knowledge comes from speaking to our members directly, right? So here's some of the things we hear in terms of that harmful experience. And it comes back to bias, as we've heard, in that the woman who is pregnant that goes in for a visit, and this is her second child, and maybe at the last visit there was a conversation about contraception. The half eye roll and the judgment right, about, oh, you're pregnant again, what happened to the plan? It's my body. And who are you to sit in judgment? So we have these measures in insurance because we, want to, we have to be accredited right, by a national body. And so when a woman doesn't come in in the first trimester, that's not good, right? Knowing that black and brown women are more likely to have poor health outcomes, part of it happens because they don't come in until the third trimester, especially if they've had other children. They're like, I got this, I'm not worrying about it. In fact, that's very harmful. However, when I talk with our moms, they say, I just don't want to go through that process. Everything from when I check in and I give my insurance card and I get the, uh, you know, or when I get into the appointment and I say I'm pregnant and the plan that we had devised together didn't work. So please think about the opportunity which to me falls into the qualitative piece, right? To improve someone's experience. To me, that is doable by all parties all along, up and down the healthcare delivery system. So that's point one. The second piece, a point that I, I didn't hear about and I want to highlight is Dr. Nesbitt talked about the geographic distribution. We definitely need to do more there because we've got amazing and awesome complex places where you can go for complex needs, and then it kind of falls off. We need more substance use disorder treatment. We need more treatment for women who have their children so that they will go and get their substance use disorder treatment. And we need a larger variety and broader array of types of people who are non-clinical that can give that longer support over time. It doesn't cost as much to have a doula, a community health worker, a peer support worker, who really are there just in time to provide expert support, navigation, and to be that link to help someone feel that they've got someone by their side, right? Mm. And so we've got to think about that as an opportunity to help people because not everyone knows all the things they need to know, right? But if you give me support until I get to that point of sufficiency and resilience, it is less likely that the next time I'm not able to nav navigate. Lastly, I want to focus on the opportunity with providers. We can certainly educate providers more about respectful care and their teams and their offices because any one offense makes someone not want to come back. We also need to think about how we reimburse providers, right? So for ooh, probably at least a decade, right, alternative payment models have been in place. 
They're more robust in Medicare. We're working through that process in Medicaid. If we want providers to do more, yes, we can align payment with the medical outcomes and quality outcomes. We need to also align it with adjustments that take into account the myriad of social factors we've discussed so that they have time or can employ people who have the time to have those conversations and give those connections and support. We can't expect providers who are, especially in small and mid-sized practices, to give all of that wraparound whole person care without thinking through our reimbursement strategy so that they are paid and have that payment be risk adjusted for those providers who unduly have a burden of more people who are living in under-resourced uh, environments. It, it just won't work. And so that's part of the story that sometimes happens with the hospitals, right? Mm. That things keep going down and down and down because there's just not a reimbursement structure that supports the additional risk sufficiently to have the best staff and teams and additional wraparound services. The district has made huge investments. I have worked in all parts of the system, including leading a, running a hospital, the only hospital at the time still that we have in, across the river, right? And so I know that we have done so much over the past 22 years to create the system we have today. We have the right basis to create the level of outcomes that match the investments that we've made. And what I see is just all opportunity for us to do that. It's funny in this town, most people know each other. They're like no degrees of separation, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine the good that we can do together if we really focus. And the pandemic has taught us that we can make quick decisions. We can leverage data to create more understanding and take better actions and measure them. And so I look forward to how we do that. Thank you. Um, I want to, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of a bus. I do, I, you know, we're coming, we're nearing an hour of our discussion and I, before we do, I wanna be sure to discuss housing segregation, um, arguably the largest manifestation of structural racism that affects health. Um, and to kick us off, I'm actually hoping to hear from uh, Catherine Croslin, who is um, at Unity Healthcare. Um, she leads the homeless outreach there. Um, yeah, no, okay. do we have a mic for her? Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Catherine Crossland. First of all, thank you so much to Health Affairs and to Amanda Gomez for including me in this event. I am honored and humbled to be in such great company. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about um, my expertise is not necessarily on segregation and health outcomes, but really on treating people experiencing homelessness. I've had the privilege for the past 12 plus years of working for Unity Healthcare, serving people experiencing homelessness, along with my colleague, Dr. Cardile. Um, and to speak to issues of racism and health, um, while 44% of residents um, identify as black or African American in the city, over 90% of the patients that we serve um, who are experiencing homelessness in DC identify as black or African American. So just an incredible um, disparity right there, which speaks to generations, as folks have mentioned, of uh, entrenched poverty and lack of opportunity, to act, lack of access to um, decent medical care, um, behavioral health, et cetera. Um, so Unity has tried over the years to meet our patients where they are in an attempt to decrease barriers to accessing uh, high quality health care. So in the homeless sector, we create clinics in shelters, in day centers. We have a street medicine program to try to meet folks where they are. You asked if any medical providers here have had to try to earn our patients' trust. And I absolutely, every single day, feel like I do my best to try to earn my patients' trust. And often in the street medicine program, we are taking that first step to reach out to folks and, um, and develop the relationships that, that ultimately we hope to um, engage folks in, in uh, engaging in their health care, managing their diabetes, their high blood pressure, uh, their HIV, let, and you know, not to mention the routine preventive health care. 
Um, and as this article so beautifully um, describes, which I did have a chance to read Dr. King's article <laughs> uh, this afternoon, um, it really, you know, the, the rates of um, increased diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, HIV, et cetera, um, in black population versus the white population in DC is just, is just astounding. And, and it's so well summarized in this article. Um, so I just want to say that I so wholeheartedly agree that health care alone, access to health care alone, certainly is not going to um, answer this problem. Because, um, you know, I think a lot about the fact that I've tried to perfect my ability to care for somebody's diabetes when they're living under a bridge. But at the end of the day, if their A1C drops by two points and I get kudos from Amera Health for improving their, their health score on the report card, um, really, what have I done about the fact that they are at risk for dying of hypothermia or being assaulted? or just the stress and anxiety of, of living outside or in a, in a homeless shelter. So I um, think a lot about the sort of the safety nets, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that our patients um, are often sort of falling through these nets, and we're here to kind of try to, try to do our best to catch. But what I would really love to see in this city is rather than nets, through which people fall for us to create a social fabric that is tight enough that there aren't any holes. So that we invest in people's lives from prenatal care to early childhood development to good quality education all the way along the way, access to medical care and housing, obviously, I think is a huge part of that. And I was thrilled with the mayor's um, the, the ch change in the tax code to increase the number of housing vouchers that we're going to be able to afford um, in the city. So it's, it's not quite exactly segregation, but I think that, that sort of homelessness and people experiencing homelessness in D.C. are sort of um, emblematic of, of you know, this, this uh, experience of, of years of segregation and entrenched poverty. So, Thank you, Catherine, for that. And it looks like I think... Derek would like to respond is that, yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that often we think about segregation, we don't define it quite as well as we could. And segregation actually means a broad range of things. We tend to now look at it as a snapshot in time that at like race-based residential segregation, are the, is the distribution of where people live the same? What we're missing is that segregation was an intentional policy that actually deliberately um, pushed people to move in different places, and it wasn't necessarily by choice, and that that was an, an intentional policy that was legal, and that we actually had things in place to do that. So when we only look at where people live at this particular snapshot in 2022, but don't look at the historical context of how we got here, we can't come up with effective solutions to fix how did we get here if we don't completely understand that. And so the, the intentionality is in the idea of mapping race in place. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Nesbitt was saying earlier, we don't tend to distance, most of our data systems don't separate race from, don't give us the opportunity to look at race in place at the same time. And so we usually look at place and then we let, separately will look at race and don't really look at the fact that how do you think about the concentration of people, concentration of resources in certain areas, or the lack of concentration of resources in the area where they're needed? And so there's a mismatch when we think about that. And part of this paper was trying to make an effort to help us to better look at that geographically, as well as looking at it by race and what does that mean? Thank you for that. Oh, we have another. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Dana Matthew. I'm uh, dean at GW Law School, and I 
cannot help but follow this uh, incredibly insightful comment and the article in the discussion. Um, <clears throat> because I teach at a law school, I'm going to start by reminding us that we live in a country that was founded by a document that said all men and women are created equal. What we have heard tonight is that inequality is our systemic and institutional heritage. That's what the word racism means. It's structural because every single speaker has been able to tell us that there is disparity in health access, in housing, in homelessness, in food access. That's what it means to be structural, and that's what it means to be institutionalized. And so what I'm hoping is that I can invite every professional in this room to see health disparities as the civil rights issue of our time. Mm. There is absolutely no question in my mind that if you walk on a beach and you see one fish that's dead, you say, oh my, that fish died, how tragic. But if in every single sector you see the beach is covered with the same color fish, in every single sector you see that they are dead on the beach, that is systemic, and that's what racism means. What I love about this paper is that it starts with history. Because if you look over a 100-year history, the gap between infant mortality and all-cause mortality between blacks and whites has not changed over 100 years. So I invite outrage with respect to the word racism and incredible intentionality, to use your word, with respect to the repairs that have to reverse and undo the legalized departure from what our country says it stands for. Thank you so much. Ooh. I think we're done now. Yeah, right? I think we're done. I think I don't know how we stop. <laughs> Who'd like to top that? <laughs> no, but um, I guess my, my, my final question for the room is, I mean, given that health care is connected with all these social reforms, I mean, how do you see yourselves as being advocates for, say, housing or other other social reforms? I mean, do you, what would that, what does that activism look like? Yes, please. Well, I won't try to top that. My name is Michelle McMurray-Heath, and I'm the president and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. And I invite us to think very carefully about whether this is a question of catching up with the level of health care that our white counterparts have had for the previous 10 or 20 years, or if it's about us looking ahead at how we leapfrog access for our communities to the new and emerging health care solutions that are coming down the pike. If we think about the diseases that really impact black communities, and I'm the daughter of a public health nurse from Oakland, California, so I've spent half of my life in Oakland, half of my life in DC, and they're strikingly similar. Sickle cell, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, there are no good solutions for any of those diseases sitting in the medicine cabinet in the shelves today. So it doesn't matter if you have health insurance to purchase them. It doesn't matter if you have good treatment from the physician that will prescribe them for you. There are no solutions to be prescribed. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, where is our activism around the research dollars and the development dollars that make sure that there are new solutions produced for diseases that impact communities of color? And as long as we're fighting over the table scraps of what's available today, we may win the battle and lose the war. So just keep be future oriented in what you're thinking about and don't be satisfied with getting the same care that white patients get today. Think about the care that white patients are gonna have 10, 20 years from now and make sure that we are evening the race to get to those future solutions. Thank you. Did I see your hand up? No, okay. <laughs> oh, I have. Hi, Doctor. yeah, this is George Jones again. You know, um, Christopher mentioned earlier the 81 times the wealth gap in D.C. for whites versus blacks. I, I really believe that that is the problem, mm -hmm. that poverty is the issue. And, and someone else mentioned that Dr. King said we have the resources. We could eliminate poverty in this city if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a city of everybody in D.C. claims they're liberal. 
Uh, and so, <laughs> in theory, nobody in this city should be against ending poverty. Yet, I don't think I don't think most of us who aren't directly affected by poverty are willing to do enough of what it would take. Because if you're going to eliminate that disparity in wealth, or even if you eliminate the disparity in income, because the income disparity is also startling, we'd have to do something really, really intentional. We'd have to use um, tax dollars. We'd have to use the money to get it right into the houses of people living in poverty. Mm -hmm. And I really believe, I mean, there are a number of things we could try to do, I but I think that is the most direct way to deal with this issue. So, and so we can talk about health or talk about, let's us deal with it. Because yeah, there are a lot of other things that make us sick or that, you know, that we, the human beings need to, to have healthy lives. But systemically or holistically, I think income solving that problem would be the most efficient, effective way to sort of help us deal with. Because again, it's not that people with wealth do all the right things we don't. Or those of us who have think we have it, but we we do tend to fare better than people living under bridges and in substandard housing. And so, and but it, it would take amazing will in the city. We could do it. What does that but, look like? Does that look like universal basic income? What is that? <laughs> plus, plus, I mean, yeah, the, the, plus. The, the gap is so large hmm. that you'd have to really be talking about folks really being willing to to offer huge sums of dollars in households households uh, east of the river to really start to deal with it. And the truth of the matter is, even if you did that, my guess is that you'd still be talking about two generations before it really made the difference. Mm -hmm. Like I really believe that children and the grandchildren, the people who are living on low incomes now, could succeed because kids, and I know the scientists and doctors know this better than I do, kids are wired to succeed. Mm -hmm. But when they're up against the conditions that they're living with now, they're being set up for to not succeed. So I hope we can come up with the will, those of us liberals in this city, the will to really do something about the income gap, because I think that's the best way to, to solve these problems. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jones. I think I saw Dr. Nesbitt's hand up earlier. I'm so loud that I can <laughs> <laughs> So I, you know, it's a it's an important question. I don't want to miss the opportunity to say this. And I thought George was George went almost to where I was going. Mm, which good. is we have to challenge ourselves on how much we really think we are embracing health equity and the achievement of health equity in this city. There are so many times that there is a policy that comes where we are really trying to achieve health equity. And then people say, oh, no, that's uh, not that. I'm not ready for that. And some people recognize it when it's the NIMBY, the not in my backyard type stuff. But there are other things that are more subtle, where people feel threatened by a perceived benefit that they may be losing that would accrue to other people. But that is when we are shifting from what is equality to equity. But folks in this town will rally for something that accrues more and more and more benefit and luxuries for them. This town is amenity rich. Let's be real clear. We will recover from any recession faster than other communities. We are amenity rich. There will be legislation to have more public bathrooms all over the town. And they will make you think that this is about individuals experiencing homelessness. But the moment individuals experiencing homelessness are the predominant users of those bathrooms, when they are asleep in them, when they are bathing in them in the, in the, in the, in the sink, then it will all of a sudden be, we need to lock them. We need to make sure that they are only for people who are running marathons and out on a leisurely run. They will make you think that those are equity initiatives, but they are not. So we have to get serious about what we mean when we say equity in education, when we say equity in employment opportunities, when we say equity in housing. And we have to be very cautious when we are examining legislation and getting people to move forward legislation that is indeed about equity and not just accruing more amenity-rich things for those of us who are already privileged and living with luxuries. There are enough resources to solve these problems in this town, but we have to be focused and we have to be the voice of the people who don't have one. That is the only way that we will solve this problem in DC and anywhere. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Thank you. I, oh, I was gonna say about that. <laughs> So I want to remind people of where we are in this particular time in terms of eviction moratoria and that all of the good work that we've done 
is going to be pretty soon lost because we have all these people who are living right on the edge anyway, who are going to lose where they live, even though it's maybe substandard, right? And that when they get moved out, eventually the building empties, someone else buys it, and it becomes a higher rent property. So we need to be thinking about through an equity lens, what do we do now that addresses that? One of the things that is being done is good funding has been put toward ensuring that there's civil legal representation so that people at least have someone on their side. However, that is a looming crisis that's gonna set us back at least a decade in terms of progress that we've made. And so back to thinking holistically about the problems that we can't allow us ourselves to lose ground on important gains that have been made. Thank you. And I think, I mean, we've just about hit an hour and I think this is a good time to get Christopher's reflection on this conversation around his paper. Should we? <laughs> yeah. My goodness, this has been a great conversation. A wonderful conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. We, we have touched a lot of topics tonight, and I just want to quickly just share, and I think this is something I'm hope, hope, hopefully will be helpful for everyone. You know, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in education, right? And so we're teaching the next generation of med students and, and health administrators and nursing students. And what we're doing differently is that we are talking about our history. If we want to address the issues that you were talking about, Diane, um, it's very systemic. And I think that once people understand the issues and the history, we will be much more effective. And once we put systems in place in our organizations that can help mitigate risk of bias, you know, we talk about the individual, but we need to look at the systems in which we operate. And I'm not just talking about healthcare, I'm talking about every sector. Every discipline needs to go through this critical analysis, critical audit of the, its history, how decisions are made, what those norms are, and identify opportunities for change. And so that covers all disciplines. And so again, the purpose of the paper was to reflect on the history of the city and to help us be more impactful in our work. This paper is also a gift to transplants. I can't tell you how many people, residents we've talked to, who go to providers and go to different places for care or services, and they're talking to people who do not understand the city, do not respect the culture here, the history here, the richness that exists in this city. And that creates this gap, right? It creates a disconnect and folks are not engaged and not, they're not getting the services that they deserve. So I'm hoping that this will be a gift for folks who are new to the city or do not know much about the history of the city. It is an important part if we want to be impactful in our work and if we truly are serious about health equity. So I can go on and on, but I'm gonna stop and I think we're turning it over to, to Alan now. Again, thanks everyone and I hope that the paper will be helpful to you in your work. So I just I I want to end on the high note that we were on and not drag you down. So Christopher, thank you. I've had the pleasure of knowing you since uh, we were on the Consumer Health Foundation. Now the IF Foundation board, I learned so much from that experience and so much from you there. And you have given us a gift, and I'm glad that that's how you see the paper. So I think the right way to end this evening is to say. We hope that all of what we're doing here can be received as a gift. It's material. It's food for thought. It's the basis for a conversation. It's an interview that hopefully you'll watch the full film of uh, when it comes out tomorrow. It's a three-hour release event where we're going to go through all the papers tomorrow afternoon, and Secretary Becerra will be offering some comments. It's the swag at your desk so you don't forget who we are at Health Affairs. Um, so please, uh, we're, we're grateful for your participation in this, but mostly we want to, to uh, offer it up as a basis for supporting the community where we work in the little way that we can. And speaking of gifts, where'd she go? Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for the gift of your leadership today. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm glad we found you. We won't lose you. <laughs> and really appreciate you taking us through the conversation. So thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, we can't wait to see what comes out of this conversation and so many more. And the passion and action that, that we tapped into toward the end. That's really where we've got to go. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>